few would have guessed that a modestly budgeted adaptation of a short-lived science fiction series could have any real staying power in the realm of modern blockbusters. So when Joss Whedon's 2005 film Serenity hit theaters, it seemed destined to fade into mainstream obscurity like its television counterpart before. However, not only did the film find critical praise upon its initial release, it now stands as a semi-classic and an anomaly amongst the crop of sequels and remakes that largely made up the high-concept films of its time. Somehow, Serenity was able to appeal to mainstream moviegoers in a way that the show it was based on had not, transcending a niche fanbase to find a larger audience and stand the test of time. Beyond its witty dialogue and effective story structure, one can point to Serenity's skillful blending of genre conventions to evoke a certain grandiosity and relevance that surpasses its modest budget, in order to make it not only a novel and entertaining movie, but a poignant critique on genre filmmaking. Serenity is what could be called a genre hybrid film. It's a combination or collision between normally distinct and well-recognized genres, in this case the western genre being melded with the science fiction genre. To examine how Serenity masterfully plays with the conventions and disparities between these genres, we first have to explain what exactly a genre is and how we recognize one. Film professor and scholar Rick Altman classifies genre as an interplay between semantics and syntax. The semantics of a genre are what most people would recognize as the visual markers of established film types. These are the icons and images that we associate with each distinct genre. The semantics of the western genre, for example, are icons like horses, cowboy hats, guns, saloons, and shootouts. In science fiction, the semantics would pertain to things like spaceships, aliens, laser guns, and robots. But these are just the words that make up the language of a genre. The syntax of a genre is the grammar and structure that makes each one distinct. These are the thematic and narrative conventions that we associate with the genre in question. So for the Western, the story usually concerns the divide between the old world and the new, civilization and the frontier. They are stories of the past becoming the present, and of the pioneers who conquered an untamed landscape to bring it into modernity, and the heroes and villains who fought to make it so. Westerns typically focus on a lone, male individual who must guide and protect members of the civilized world through the still savage and untamed wild of the Old West. Frequently he's an outlaw, condemned by the laws of the New World, and often he is a soldier on the losing side of a war. His time is ending, but he uses his skill and knowledge to protect the good people of the New World that he will never truly belong to. In science fiction, stories often focus more on a collective of people, and feature a voyage into the mysterious unknowns of space. Though they typically begin with a crew or group, they usually end with a focus on a singular individual and their very personal and introspective quest for meaning and understanding. While the Western is about expansion and conquest, sci-fi stories are a journey of recession and withdrawal, the vast emptiness and mysteries of space becoming a metaphor for self-discovery and the depths of the human psyche. The ways in which Serenity blends the semantics of both genres is apparent from a glance. Visually, one can easily discern the Western-inspired images such as gun holsters, desert plains, ghost towns, bar brawls, and bank heists. The captain of the Firefly-class ship Serenity, Malcolm Reynolds, epitomizes the film's referral to the classic Western, as he is in almost every way the prototypical cowboy hero. He is rash, brazen, sardonic, and hardened by a history of violence. He is outwardly tough, but virtuous at heart. A quick draw, a dead-eye shooter, and a dogged brawler. He is essentially the Ringo Kid, or Ethan Edwards, or any other iteration of John Wayne's cowboy hero character in his classic western films. But these are all semantic associations based on Mal's appearance and behavior. What of his syntactic associations? Like Ringo Kid or Ethan Edwards, Mal is leading a group through the perils of a dangerous world flying in the face of a large, impending, authoritative force that is gradually erasing, assimilating, and collectivizing the old world into a new, more civilized society. Like the cowboy, Mal lives by the rules of the old world and stubbornly refuses to join the new one, despite the apparent inevitability of its imposition. If we establish that on a spectrum of generic duality, Mal could be seen to represent the quintessential American Western, where then do the other major characters fall in relation? If Mal is the traditional Western hero, then he has a clear nemesis in The Operative, a skilled assassin sent to do the dirty work of the Alliance. The Operative sports the proverbial black hat in the classical Western dynamic, 
likening him to villains like Sheriff Bill Dagger in Unforgiven, or Frank in Once Upon a Time in the West. Though he is fighting for a new civilized world, it is not a world he will live in, and he performs his dastardly work with an unnerving frigidity and nonchalance. From there we might identify Jane as the ugly to Mal's good and the bad of the operative, serving as the wildcard character WILDCARD BITCHES! Yeah! whose allegiances are never set in stone. Furthermore, Simon Tam fits the bill as the out of his depth doctor, and Shepard Book as the priest with the mysterious past, both well-worn archetypes of the classical western. We could then view Inara as Serenity's version of the hooker with the heart of gold, except that her role as an escort, or companion, is actually one that endows her with a great respect in the world of Serenity's story. We see here a blurring of the conventions of one genre to introduce aspects of another, that being the historical lionization of women in the science fiction genre, as opposed to the western. While in classical westerns, hookers and prostitutes are common characters, they are nearly always looked down upon in some way, or meant to be inherently shameful or lowly in their stead. If they do have redeeming qualities, it is in spite of their profession, and not because of it. However, in Serenity we see a reversal of this archetype with Inara, whose profession is associated more so with nobility and admiration than with denigration or shame. A further bending of traditional generic language is seen in the relationship between Wash and Zoe, Wash being the more effeminate and needy of the two, while Zoe is a stoic and action-oriented fighter. Kaylee, the ship's mechanic, also reverses traditional gender norms by being not only extremely adept at a trade usually reserved for men, but also very open and vocal about her libido and her sexuality. We can place these characters around the middle of our generic spectrum, as they fit into some aspects of western conventions, but overtly defy them in others. At the far end of the spectrum, furthest from the paradigm of the western hero, we find River Tam, a girl endowed with psychic powers and martial arts skills that makes her strange and anomalous amongst even her eclectic crewmates. River is very much cast in the mold of the traditional science fiction hero. We can liken her to characters such as Ripley in the Alien series, Sarah Connor in the Terminator films, or Lilu in The Fifth Element, where Mal is an agent of action, leading the crew into the frontier of scattered human settlements, River is introspective, her journey coming through the negotiation of her own damaged psyche, and her search for the meaning of her strange visions. Where Mal's journey is external, hers is internal, placing them at opposing poles of generic tradition. Serenity's most brilliant turn, however, is in introducing a third element into this dynamic between Western and sci-fi, the Reavers. The Reavers simultaneously act as both archetypes of both genres, and the destroyers of their classical paradigms. In the stanchion of the western, the Reavers can be viewed as an interpretation of the Indians that were heavily featured in John Ford westerns. The Indian is the great enemy of the classical western cowboy, the mysterious and dangerous figures that appear from nowhere and bear down on travelers without discrimination or mercy. In early westerns, Indians were depicted as inhuman, barbaric figures, never given any agency or voice with which to identify them as individuals. They are simply a threat, a horde to be evaded and, if necessary, destroyed. To encounter them is the greatest threat to the people of the New World, and it is better to die than to be taken among them. From the standpoint of the sci-fi film, the Reavers could be compared to aliens. Their motives are mysterious, and their violence non-negotiable. We can also see parallels to zombies or creatures like John Carpenter's The Thing, as their bodies are mutilated and violated by the entity that possesses it. Though the Reavers fit into the conventions of both genres, they can also be seen to embody the potential corruptibility of both the Western and sci-fi film. As a commentary on the Western's depiction of the American Indian, the Reavers allude to the fact that early representations of native people were horribly offensive and damaging, as diverse and eclectic groups of First Nations people were painted with broad brushes and crude stereotypes. I heard they attack settlers from space and kill them and wear their skins and rape them for hours and hours. In the film, the stories and hearsay of Reavers is ignorant of the fact that, as we later discover, they are simply people who are corrupted and decimated by the meddling of a supposedly advanced colonizing culture. This is evidenced by the film drawing attention to the false narrative spread by the Alliance and their suppression of truth reminding us that film is an instrument of culture, and can be used as a colonizing mechanism to effectively rewrite history. 
often to the great detriment of the colonized. On the other hand, as components of the sci-fi genre, the Reavers are confined to their ships, which engage in a massive space battle with Alliance vessels. From a narrative stance, this space battle is simply background noise as our perspective remains with the smaller ship and the characters it houses. While the Reavers and the Alliance are engaged in a battle of epic proportions, rendered in surely very expensive CGI, we the audience have no real investment in it. We don't care about which side wins because neither side has characters we care about. We care about the crew in the small Firefly-class vessel, hurtling like a leaf on the wind through the noise and chaos of the larger fight. The Reavers in this case are agents of spectacle, but it is a spectacle without meaning. The heart of the science fiction genre has always been the journey within, away from the superficiality of external conflict and towards self-discovery and understanding. The crux of Serenity's story is not the space battle and who eventually wins it, but the personal battle within our main characters. As the conflict rages overhead, our main characters fight for something far more important. In committing to spreading the truth and exposing the fallibility of the Alliance, Mal finds something to believe in, awakening himself to notions of the transcendent and the ephemeral. In protecting her friends, River finds solace and balance in her mind defeating her inner demons through the confrontation with literal ones. In this way, Serenity depicts the intermingling of these genres through exploring their commonalities and breaking down their traditional paradigms. The Western hero opens himself up, and the sci-fi hero finds direction. In the face of the potential darkness and corruption inherent to storytelling and filmic representation, they strive for a place of equality, optimism, and the incontestable value of truth. United, they pilot the small underdog craft, thrown cheaply together with spare and imperfect parts, towards an uncertain future. A future where, through the raging storm, we hope to someday find serenity. <laughs>